We'll start. My name is Judy Birdie. I'm president of the Roosevelt Island Historical Society. I've lived on the island for the last 40 years. They just don't let me off. <laughs> and uh, today we're going to discuss and show images of the island before Roosevelt Island. Everything here is pre-1973. So have to go back in time. As many of you may see a map of New York, this is New York uh, probably in the 1850s. The island now goes from 46th Street to 86th Street in Manhattan. So in those days, it was about a half a mile shorter. And uh, is the microphone working OK? OK. And the island uh, currently is 147 acres. And in those days, uh, that we just had these institutions uh, on the island, and it was named for Blackwells, which was the family that owned the island uh, from the 1700s on, from pre-revolution. OK. What year did you say that was? That, that was 1840s, that map. Yeah, this is a map of the island, an aerial from Fairchild Aerial taken in the 1920s. And you can see that it was full of buildings. People think that when they developed the island in the 1970s, uh, there was nothing there before. There was plenty there before. And uh, at the very southern tip, you can see the smallpox hospital. And now there's landfill at the south end of the island where the FDR 4 Freedoms Park is. And this was the city hospital, which we'll discuss the municipal hospital. All of this area was the Blackwells Island Penitentiary. This was uh, the Queensborough Bridge, which opened in 1909. The quarry, where the prisoners quarried the stone. The city home, which was uh, the city home uh, for the aged. And then Metropolitan Hospital at the very top of the island. So the island in, in those days probably had about as many people living there and working there as we do now. Now we have 14,000. So people look at this and go, wow, I didn't know there was anything there before the miracles of the 1970s. And if you look at the picture in Manhattan, there's no FDR drive. So you can see the age. This is a close-up picture of the quarry. And the quarry was uh, operated by the penitentiary. And I want you to guess who was quarrying the stone. The prisoners, right. You know the expression, breaking rock? That's, that was the quarry. And the little buildings next to the quarry were cottages for the uh, high-level management of the institutions on the island. And the Blackwell Farmhouse was right there. And then the city home and the different institutions were beyond it. So, yes, sir. Yeah, absolutely. It's Fordham Nyes, and to this day, you can still see outcroppings of the stone in different parts of the island. And they use that. Uh, the island's all rock. It is, <laughs> it's just rock. Queens has swamps and waterways, and you know they had quicksand. We have rock. And was that stone used elsewhere? Not that I know of. And the quarry sort of ran out in the 1920s, so they didn't use it after. What? Well, it's called Fordham Nyes, which is a type of granite. This is one of the early pictures of the penitentiary. This was before it had multiple additions. The penitentiary opened in the 1820s, and uh, the prisoners were brought from Manhattan. And before the building was built, guess who built the prison? The prisoners. Yes. There was no such thing as getting away with anything. The prisoners built the prison. And here's a picture of the prisoners in the quarry. And you can see it's below ground level. They were digging it out. And there's their water barrel and their guard watching them. And they used to call the prisoners zebras. Why? Well, look at their uniforms. They look like striped zebras. And this is uh, them. I presume this was lunch break, because they all seem to be sitting down. And you can see the buildings to the north of the island beyond it. 
This is a picture of the penitentiary probably, well, it's definitely after 1909 and probably in the 1920s. The penitentiary just kept expanding, like zigzag, zigzag, well, let's add another wing, you know. And the prison was, had a terrible reputation. Uh, one report from the state was that there was no, uh, no plumber had ever been in the building unless he was incarcerated. Every morning, the prisoners took their night waste out to the river. You can imagine. Uh, and the cells were very, they were something like four feet by eight feet. They were horribly uncomfortable and cold and damp. One of our famous prisoners was Emma Goldman, the anarchist. She spent a year in the penitentiary around 1896. And luckily, being a an educated woman, uh, she was befriended by the doctor at one of our hospitals, and he taught her to be a nurse, and she was thrilled because she got out of being in the prison all day because it was so horrible. And uh, so, but most of our prisoners uh, suffered horribly there. When did it close? It closed in 1936. The last prisoner was sent off to the brand new Rikers Island. And some other people that were in prison there was William Marcy Tweed, Boss Tweed. He was there for a year. We have a feeling he sort of might have been in the warden's house. We don't think, there was a beautiful Victorian house next to the uh, penitentiary that had an in-ground swimming pool. And we have a feeling Mr. Tweed might have been there. We also had the workhouse, which was up the street a little, and one of the famous visitors at the workhouse was, uh, was Mae West. She was uh, arrested in a sh for being in a show called Sex and sentenced to 10 days in the women's workhouse in 1927. And supposedly every afternoon, the warden took her for a spin around the island. And she complained that the muslin underwear was not as good as her silk. Oh, c'est la vie. So the penitentiary closed in 1936, and the workhouse had closed a few years earlier, and the prisoners were sent off the island, and then uh, other institutions were remaining there. When you came to the island, this was the pier at the, at the south end. This was where they pulled the ferry boats up to, and then you were shipped off to one of the hospitals. Yes? This is from the Municipal Archives. This is probably the 1890s, approximately. That's them. That, no, they had the same pier, but they went to do, that was the Small Fox Hospital yeah. originally. That, it's a tiny building, and it was uh, built for the, the rich patients had one floor, and they had to pay a dollar a day. The poor people didn't have to pay, but the mortality rate was terrible because there really was no treatment. And you had to go to the hospital. If you contracted smallpox, they made you come to Blackwell's Island. And it was a very bad situation because they did not really get treatment and the mortality rate was terrible. And the smallpox itself, vaccinations were uh, started in the 1870s and after a few years, they no longer needed a hospital exclusively for smallpox, so it became a communicable disease hospital. And it then closed in the early 1890s, and it moved to North Brother Island. And who was the most famous patient on North Brother Island? Mary. Very good, Mary Mallon, right. Another Mary Mary, <laughs> yes. And everyone says what we do to is, was Typhoid Mary here? No, she was at Riverside Hospital, which is off the coast of 135th Street in the Bronx. This is the smallpox hospital after it was converted to the third school of nursing in the United States. And it was called the New York Training School for Nurses. And the north wing was added and the south wing. And it's funny because uh, the original building was designed by James Renwick Jr. And there are two wings, they look exactly the same, but it had to be a municipal contract because one wing was designed by York and Sawyer and the other wing was designed by Renwick Aspinwall. So you have th th uh, two different firms designing two different wings that look exactly the same around a year or two apart. So that was used as a training school for nurses uh, until the 1940s, early 50s, and then it was abandoned. This is another picture of the entrance, and 
the, the training school uh, was, had wonderful uh, brochures and one of them showed the young ladies playing croquet in front of the building and it said, uh, they had tennis also, but they said, if tennis is too strenuous, we have croquet. So, uh, of course, the nursing students worked for three or four years, got paid nothing, and it was virtually slave labor. But they came from fine families, and it was a very respectable profession. When did that get torn down? It's, it, it's falling down, not tearing down, <laughs> Susan. <laughs> no, it's still there. It was there the other day when I looked. <laughs> Susan and I go back and forth on our old history. <laughs> It's really sad because the building has been abandoned for many years. They've done some stabilization, but it's in really bad shape. And did anyone say they had $50 million here? You know, plus Roosevelt Island's operated by the state of New York, but that's a whole different lecture. It has, yes. <laughs> and this is the charity hospital, which opened as charity hospital, then became city hospital. That was, went across the island, east to west, and this is when it first opened, and it was also a municipal hospital uh, for acute cases. And what they would do is the ferry boat landed on uh, one day of the week, they would put all the people in this hospital, the next day they would put them in the hospital at the north end of the island. <laughs> they were not very selective of where people went. And these hospitals were enormous, they would have a census of over a thousand beds. You know, There was no, uh, no one was telling them to discharge early. This is Strecker Memorial Laboratory. Strecker Lab was one of the, one of the first pathology labs in the United States. It opened uh, at the turn of the century. It was part of the city hospital, and afterwards it became part of, oh God, I just lost my brain. I'll think of the name of the organization. But it operated, and the little building you see in the back, you can just see that little roof? That's where they performed the autopsies. It was all pathology, and they were doing, they had uh, autopsies and uh, pathologists working there. And when I first moved to the island, we would go down there and we would see they still had the shelves coming out of the refrigerators for the bodies. And I have lots of pictures that people took in the 1960s of the body parts in the laboratories. Uh, oh. Hey, it's an interesting, <laughs> what? That's a different well, show. <laughs> Yes, that was the steam, one of the steam plants, yes. We had a few power plants on the island. This is the maternity hospital. Dr. Henry Garegis, who was an expert, well, who's an obstetrician gynecologist, uh, was the first doctor on, to realize that these women were dying of septicemia and what they call childbed fever because the doctors were next door with the city hospital amputating uh, legs with gangrene and people with infections. And then they would come next door to the hospital and deliver babies. So he stopped that. He built the separate maternity hospital and only the doctors could only come in if they, everything was clean and everything was scrubbed. And trust me, what they used to clean people, you were clean. And uh, the infant mortality rate went down uh, enormously. And it became very popular for women to go to a hospital that was so, uh, they got such good care. Because until then, women would not go to a hospital to deliver their babies. They would have them at home because it was safer. So this is the maternity hospital. Oh, at the North End, we had our famous lunatic asylum. This is the picture. It was designed by Alexander Jackson Davis. It opened in the 1830s. And there's a picture here of little boats going up there. But it was, uh, it faced, this, this view faces Manhattan. And the boats would come and discharge the passengers and or the, what they would call the patients. And it was really sad. The fa most famous story is of a, a journalist. Who was it? Right, Nellie Bly, and her real name was Elizabeth Cochran. She was from Pennsylvania, and she decided to come to New York and become a journalist. So she went to the New York World newspaper and uh, Joseph Pulitzer's staff, and she said, I want to do this, and they said, well, I don't know who said who. If She became an undercover reporter, and she had herself, uh, she went to an, uh, what they called a rooming house, uh, for young ladies, and she checked into this rooming house 
and she started acting weird. She claimed she did not act absolutely crazy, but she was babbling in, she said, foreign tongues. And after two or three days, they were looking at her and saying, this girl's crazy. So the police took her to Bellevue Hospital, where after a thorough psychiatric review of probably 10 minutes, they deemed her insane. They kept her a few days and shipped her off to Blackwell's Island. Now you can imagine, you went up the river, you went to this strange place, and it was not a good place to go, and the treatment was terrible. They did give her a bath by throwing her in a, a dirty tub of water and giving her a dirty towel, and uh, that had been used by other people. You know, it's, when you read it, it's gross. And the food was horrible, and most of the quote-unquote nurses were really female inmates from the, pen, from the workhouse. So you know, these were really kind, loving people. So she, and oh, the women were also made to sit on a bench or sit on a chair like this eight hours a day. So if you didn't go crazy, come crazy, they made you crazy. And the treatment was absolutely horrendous. So she, uh, luckily, the lawyers came from the newspaper and got her out after 10 days. She wrote a, a, a serial in the newspaper called 10 Days in the Madhouse because in those days you wrote you know, 20 lines a day for the rest of the year kept the story going. And uh, an investigation ensued. And what happened, of course, was that when the, uh, all the uh, staff and the other inmates she had written about showed up, they were all scrubbed clean, perfectly lovely, charming. And uh, the Department of Charity and Correction, which ran the asylum, was given another million dollars but very little ever ended up at the asylum. And the asylum, uh, as an asylum, closed in the 1890s because the state of New York took over psychiatric hospitals and it moved to uh, wards in Randall's Island and this became Metropolitan Hospital, which was a general hospital. We'll have some pictures of Met later. Also on the island was the almshouse, the city home for the elderly, and disabled. This is one of the buildings. They had many, many buildings, most of them surrounding the center of the island, the chapel. And uh, so this is the, the building where they would all go to see movies and entertainment. And for some reason, they called it the Klondike. It was a glass enclosed building. And the uh, what they called, they called them inmates. I think it's a terrible name. The residents would go there for different amusements. And there are kids that grew up on the island whose parents worked at the different institutions. And they would go there at night to see the movies. And they would sit up on the railing with the projectionist. And the kids thought it was great. You know, the, the kids don't care. They were having a good time. And one of the occupations they did uh, was giving the elderly people something to do. So one year, the Metropolitan Opera donated a bunch of old wooden seats from the theater. And this man carved something like 100 sets of salad forks and spoons from all this wood. You know, remember that bent wood that they would have? Well, you know, they, they were creative. They had very little things to do. There was not much called occupational therapy in those days. So they would do that and, you know, they would sit around and there was a whole group of old soldiers who were there uh, left over from the Civil War and uh, they were, used to tell stories. But here they are outside the Klondike. And here are the girls. The girls were made to wear mat ticking dresses, you know what mattress ticking is, the blue and white stripe, and floppy bonnets, which they hated because it would fall over their face. And uh, there were many, many elderly, and different groups would come to minister to them. One of them was the, uh, well, the Episcopal was the Apple, Bibles and Apple Ministry. They would bring them fruit, and they would bring them Bibles. And every bed had a different color. If you were Jewish, you had a blue. If you were Catholic, you had yellow. If you were pink, you had a pink card by your bed. So this woman told me, well, we only gave our fruit to our people. So you can imagine what it was like. It's like, well, you got an apple. You know, it was really sad. And, but the different groups would come and minister to their members of their, their religion. This is the octagon, which is, it was really Metropolitan Hospital at this time, after the lunatic asylum left. 
and this floor was added. This was operating rooms. And one reason they, had, they added a top floor is that operating rooms in those days needed skylights because there was not enough artificial light. So they added the top floor. And Metropolitan Hospital was there until 1955 when the building was abandoned. And Metropolitan then moved to 97th Street and First Avenue where it still is today. This is Chapel of the Good Shepherd, which was there this morning when I left the building. It did not blow away yesterday. And it is, uh, was designed by Frederick Clark Withers, and it opened in November of 1889. It was built for the New York City Protestant Episcopal Mission Society. And if you were a female, you went into the south door. If you were a male, you went into the north door. There was no mingling, even though they were wearing those bonnets. And the first minister was William Glennie French. And he not only served this hospital, he served as the Episcopal minister at the lunatic asylum. And he worked on the island for over 20 years. And he was the kind of, and the prisoners would row him over every day to come to work from the city. They would pick him up in a big rowboat, bring him out to the island. He averaged walking three miles a day, and he ministered to his parish and to the hospitals, and he would go to many of the institutions there. And he, uh, he died on a, the day he served his purpose. He died after work one day, and he was uh, a real, you know, one of those people you call a saint, and when you read about him, you know, he was really there for the, for the very, very poor population of the island. This was the, a Catholic uh, church that was next door. This was Our Lady Consoler of the Afflicted. You knew where you were. <laughs> and this was, uh, the only pictures I can ever find of this building is when it was under construction. And it was built around 1910, and it was built for the Catholic population. We also had a synagogue that was built in the 1920s by the National Council of Jewish Women. And at the north end of the island, we had two more churches because the Metropolitan Hospital treated tuberculosis patients. They could not mingle with the general population uh, on the island. So we had Holy Spirit Church, which is an Episcopal church, and we had uh, Sacred Heart Church. So we had lots of ministries. We didn't might have good care in these homes or great hospitals, but we had lots of ministries. And this is Good Shepherd. At some point, they thought that it would be really good to cover the place in ivy. <laughs> and we have other pictures where it had a, a cabbage pa uh, vegetable garden surrounding it. So it has been there 120 some years now, and uh, it's still going strong. This is our lighthouse, which was also designed by James Renwick Jr. It was built. Uh, in the 1870s, and there was a, this part of the island was a little bit separate from the north end of the island by the asylum. There was um, like a wetlands, and one of the inmates of the asylum, John McCarthy, claimed that he owned it, and he built a little fort up at the north end of the island. So when the city department of charities and corrections wanted to buy it, they had to buy it from him, so they went and got monopoly money and bought it with Monopoly money. And there was a plaque, which of course is now gone, that says, this is the, that's typical of Roosevelt Island, it's now gone. This is the work was done by John McCarthy. All ye who pass by pray for his soul when he dies. And the, the lighthouse is a national landmark and it's, on, it's a New York City and state landmark. And I just want you to look at this picture from the 1940s. No seawall, no protection, nothing, you know? No railings, <laughs> you know? That's how most of the island was, no railings. The Queensboro Bridge was opened in 1909, and the bridge being a cantilever, it was built in three sections, the Manhattan section, the Queens section, and the Blackwell's Island section. And it fit, when they put all three sections together, it fit. But I love this picture, the Priscilla. And oh, if you, can, if you look here, this is the warden's house, the one that later had the in-ground swimming pool with the diving board. It's amazing when you get aerial. This was pre-drones, but they're really good. 
No, they were in Queens. They were in Queens, where Con Ed is, whatever it is now. Uh, th those were all gas. Yeah, those were all gas. This is the picture of the elevator storehouse building from 1916 to 1970. Uh, to reach the island by vehicle, you would drive over the lower level outer roadway and get to a midpoint where you would see a traffic light. And you go, why is there a traffic light? Because the cars could turn onto the, a little ramp between the bridge and the roof of the storehouse building and take an elevator down to get to the island. And <clears throat> the trolley car would stop. Now, if you were coming from Manhattan, you were on the wrong side of the bridge. So there was an underpass. You had to walk under the bridge to get to the elevator. You can imagine what it's like to walk under the Queensboro Bridge. You know, you're just a few feet from the cars overhead. And the elevator storehouse building also had a warehouse and different uh, shops for the institutions and had elevators that could hold fire engines, elevators that could hold tr uh, trucks. And it was demolished in 1970 and where it is is where the tram station is now. This is some of the old publicity you find when you go through uh, the records. And I love the vertical highway. Only vehicular entrance to Welfare Island is by elevator from the Queensboro Bridge. And, uh, and a picture of the Blackwell's house. The Blackwell house was the house of the Blackwell family who owned the island uh, from the 1700s until 1826. They sold it to the city for $26,000. They then had to pay an extra 20,000 because they had some problems dealing with the city. The city paid them, ended up paying them 50,000 for the island. The house is still here. And hopefully we'll finally finish the umpteenth restoration so the Historical Society can move into it. But it's right in the center of the island. It's a federal style house. Getting back to Metropolitan Hospital, this is how it looked in the 1930s and 40s. And it was, uh, in the summer, they would open up these big, probably fire escapes and put the patients out there because it was probably so hot. And you can still see the rebuilt octagon if you live on the Upper East Side. The entire, uh, the wings were torn down in 1970 and <clears throat> uh, a developer finally came along in 1990s and the building has been rebuilt. The original octagon, which is a landmark, has been completely restored and two modern buildings adjoin it and there are 500 apartments in it. And it was a really good restoration of the octagon part. The rest is an apartment house, but it did save a landmark. This is our ferry, our old ferry, the welfare. It would leave from 78th Street in Manhattan and chug it across the river, and that's met with the back of one of the Metropolitan Hospital buildings. And it would take anywhere from 10 minutes to a half hour to get there, depending on the tides because uh, sometimes the East River currents up by the north end of the island are very, very treacherous, and you could not get uh, the boat to dock, and they, they would be chasing down, the, the deckhand would be chasing down, throwing the rope for someone to catch it so they could, uh, they could anchor the boat. And this is just another building at Metropolitan Hospital. The School of Nursing was in the building, and if the nurses missed the last ferry, they were in deep trouble, the student nurses. Yes. This is the School of Nursing in the rotunda of the octagon with a Christmas tree taken in 1942. Uh, one of the nurses is still alive, her, and uh, her daughter called me recently, and they want to come and visit again. But the nurses would stand, would, they would go Christmas caroling into the wards uh, on, uh, and then they would have this giant tree coming up through the rotunda. And they yeah. they no, the, it was burnt out. We had two fires, so it's a contemporary uh, staircase. Now it's, it's made out of wrought iron, but there's none of the beautiful ironwork and scroll work there. Yes? Yes, that's right. Yeah, you could pay five cents and visit the asylum. You needed a pass, yeah. 
And also one funny tradition the student nurses had was in the first six months of training, you had to wear black stockings. Stockings are something that they had to wear. You know. Anyhow, and when they finished probation, they would all tie their stockings together and they would take them out and float them in the river. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you figured that many of these girls were not from New York, they were young, they lived on the island, they were not worldly, and they really built a team spirit because they were there. And trust me, it was not easy to get on and off the island in those days. So they had a lot of fun traditions and a lot of good stories to always to tell us. This is one of the old neurological hospital. We had many, many other hospitals on the island. And one of them was the Neurological Hospital, another was a Cancer Institute, and they all stayed until the 1950s. Goldwater Memorial, which is now gone, was built in, opened in 1939, and it was a long-term and chronic care hospital. It had as many as 1,800 patients. It probably had 800 when it left, and it was designed by Isidore Rosenfield and Sigmund S. Goldwater was the hospital commissioner and they built a hospital that had big windows, big terraces, balconies, so there was plenty of fresh air, light, and a pleasant uh, atmosphere, not like the old closed-in buildings that they had per before. Who knows what that is? Fire. Right. One of the biggest units there was polio patients, and they had lots of young people. Some of them still live on the island who came to Goldwater as polio patients, especially in 1956 when there was a large, large epidemic of polio that summer. This was the central nurses residence, which was 600 single rooms for the student nurses at the, who were studying on the island. And many of the nurses lived there because it was, a nurse didn't earn a lot of money, so she would stay there and live there during the week. And that building was also on the island. Uh, until about 1990, it was demolished. Another wonderful old building to go through. And this is the nurses. You see, even if you were a student, you had a tablecloth and linen. Everyone, they had this enormous dining room. Look at the height of that ceiling. You know. 1930, it was WPA paid for this and paid for Goldwater. Another thing we had on the hospital, on the island, was a convalescent center. Patients who had left the hospitals had nowhere to go to recover. They didn't have rehab centers and extended care facilities. So this is the plan of the convalescent center that opened uh, in 1937. And they would come out there during the day, go to physical therapy, go to occupational therapy, have lunch, just be out in the clean, fresh air. It was great if you lived in a tenement. You came out to the island and you had uh, pleasant experiences. And one of the other buildings we had on the island was the central uh, laundry. And it was also designed by um, Isidore Rosenfield and Sigmund uh, Goldwater, who was the hospital commissioner, who really believed in good providing well for patients. They were all worked under Fiorella LaGuardia. And this was a firehouse, a laundry, and a garage. And uh, it just was there when I moved to the island, it was still there. And if you looked at the pictures, you would say, gee, this looks like a contemporary of Frank Lloyd Wright, especially with the glass tower. I always loved the glass tower leading up from it. And these were all, this was a laundry. It was all glass enclosed. And unfortunately, we didn't have creative people saying, wait a minute, this building could be something. And for about 20 years, we had the fire department training center on the island. And this is one of the fire department. And I love the way they trained. They, would, they explained the system to me. It's really scary of climbing the ladder and putting the ladder up to the next window. And as you see, they have big nets. They don't even use nets anymore for real rescues. They use them for training. And they would be in the, in the river in the boat uh, training on the fire boat. And this is my, one of my favorite pictures. I love this helix leading down from the Queensboro Bridge. You see the road just going down and down and down. That was a plan that probably, luckily, was never built. But you would drive down the river, from down the bridge, down, 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 down. And that was the elevator storehouse building. We have a little helix now that we can't maintain. So this one is uh, about five levels. <laughs> Just thought it was a 
cute addition to the island. And many other plans were built that were never built. One of this is a gigantic tuberculosis hospital. Luckily, we didn't need it. And this was the Octagon or Lunatic Asylum or Metropolitan Hospital after the fire, after one fire. And you can see there's no dome. It's burnt out. This was in 1982. This is the smallpox hospital as it looks recently. Well, they mow the lawn now, but uh, it really is sad. It needs a lot of work. It's James Renwick Jr. I mean, this is the part he designed, the center part. The other wings were designed by other people. And this is Strecker Memorial Laboratory. Luckily, this has been rehabilitated. It's now a power, a power conversion station for the New York City Transit. So that is rehabilitated. And you can see the back of the smallpox hospital in the rear and the United Nations in the background. Any questions? Any comments? Yes? It was the Delacorte Fountain. Yes, the Delacorte Fountain was at the southern tip of the island uh, where, uh, well, it's almost where the FDR Memorial is now. And it, it opened in the late 60s, early 70s. It had bad problems because uh, it was, uh, had to be chlorinated and it just never worked right. And Mr. Delacorte, who gave us many, many good things in New York, just got tired of paying for it. And it was demolished in about 1992. Yes, yes ma'am. How many hospitals were there in total? In total, oh God. There was the city hospital, there was smallpox, leprosy, uh, Metropolitan Hospital, Kohler, Goldwater, and many other institutions. They, they had a, uh, NYU will deny it, but they had a primate research uh, center there. Uh, we had morgues there, we had, I mean, it was just a flourishing community of institutions. And that's all that was there. Well, lots of people lived there, and the people who worked, many of the people who worked in the hospitals, the staff, they, oh, especially, the, they lived there. No, it was not, you couldn't just go there. Oh, probably at some point, yeah. There were many institutions. Yes. Hi. Oh, hi, Judith. Hi. Thank you. Um, I have two of the, my questions is related to what's going on with um, the, with the island and the Cornell thing. Is that as many of you know, like, you know, the, like, you know they're going to be yeah. developing up the campus. Cornell also is going to be one of, one of the best preservation programs in the country. Oh, yeah. Have yeah. they considered, like, doing more? Hello. Like, Hello. <laughs> it's Cornell. No. They have, their preservation program is strictly Ithaca. And I, I mean, my last intern was from Cornell School of Historic Preservation, who's really good. But they have no, they don't associate with it. The only part of Cornell that's on the island is Cornell Tech, which is postgraduate master's, PhD programs, engineering and tech. Also, they have a master's in business, and they have a law master's and some other programs. But the, in general, it really doesn't have much to do with Ithaca. Not even the smallpox hospital that's a thousand yards from their facility. Well, no. what did, what did they it's completely separate. What did yeah. They replaced they Goldwater, Goldwater Memorial Hospital. That's right. That's right. Yes, ma'am. Too tall and interferes with views of the bridge. Okay. Too close I, to the bridge. Yes. With regard to Cornell, have you been in touch with the art and architecture program? They're based in Lower Manhattan. Oh yeah, I know Tom. I know Tom Campanella, and I know Bob Balder. Great, but I mean. The projects on Roosevelt Island, the last remaining project is the smallpox hospital. Yeah. And um, they keep getting money to do research and, pro and study in and plans, but no one ever comes up with money. And you have to realize Roosevelt Island's run by the state of New York. You think the city of New York is hard? Deal with state appointees. <laughs> or as we call them, friends of Andrew. It's very, it's worse. Anyhow, but um, at the moment, our biggest, thing is the smallpox hospital, which keeps deteriorating. And if you walk by to see the beautiful FDR memorial designed by Louis Kahn, and what do you see? You see the poor smallpox hospital surrounded by an iron fence. It's a pretty building. It's, it's beautiful. Like but <laughs> yes, ma'am. So it's a designated ruin, right? They're all designated. We have six landmarks, the right. octagon, uh, well, smallpox, strecker, Chapel, Blackwell House, Octagon, and Lighthouse. Those are all New York City landmarks, National Register, 
and state register. Part of the, still there? What? House it was there this morning. Yeah. <laughs> and they are working on it. They are definitely working on it. I can check out my window. So yes. My question is, like, is it designated differently, but it's a ruin? Well, smallpox is designated as a ruin, right. but it doesn't mean that they can't do something with it if they come up with a good plan. So you're trying to. No I'm one. Not sure I understand. No, the attempt now is to shore it up so it doesn't fall down. Yeah, that's, but to keep it as it is. Right, to keep it as it is and to find a purpose for it because it's, in, it's also in designated parkland, so you can't make it into an apartment house now. So what is the chapel used? The chapel is used every, it's used by the Episcopal, Catholic, whatever parishes are there, the community space is open, the chapel. It's not a church, by the way, because it's owned by the state of New York. It's a community center. Just happens that we have an altar and crosses and things in it, but it's not a church. <laughs> it's, yes. What's the point of designating something as a ruin as opposed to just designating it? I don't know. It was done in 1975 before I was on the island. <laughs> We just want something to happen. I mean, the octagon, which was the lunatic asylum, was a ruin. It eventually found a, a developer who came across and did, restored the octagon and added wings to make it an affordable, you know, to make it affordable for him to to restore it. What could be done with the smallpox is very hard to say because it's in a park. It's it's very hard. Uh, the infrastructure involved to just rebuild half of the stones that have come down is, a, is massive. And no one has come.